Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome. Thanks for coming out tonight to watch our webinar. This is being presented to you by the uh, GIGU and Communication Service Line from the RFS. My name is Jason Fisher. I'm here tonight to basically introduce our presenters and moderate our discussion for the evening. Um, so just a quick couple talking points before we start. Um, tonight's session will be recorded and later posted up on YouTube, um, so you will have access to it. Uh, you're going to go along, and as you get the information and want to ask questions, I think we're going to approach it in two ways. Um, there's a questions box you'll see in your control panel for the GoToMeeting system. Anything you type in there, I'll be able to see, as well as the other chat. Um, and if the presenters are going along, I'll try and interrupt them and ask your question if there's an opening. And if not, I think we'll try and address them at the end, and I'll collect them as we go through. So feel free to type them out as they come into your head, uh, and they will get answered. Um, so with that, uh, I'll jump into our intro here. Uh, tonight we have Dr. Chick and Dr. Srinivasa coming back to the big heavy hitters to do another webinar for us. Um, Dr. Chick is now at Inova Alexandria in Virginia and Dr. Srinivasa at the University of Michigan. Tonight they're gonna be speaking with us about both basic and advanced lymphatic disease and interventions um, and a little bit about their practice these days in that area. So again, thank you all for attending. Um, and at this time, I'm going to turn it over, and I think Dr. Chick, you have the, the floor now. Sounds good. All right, uh, thank you again for having us. Uh, I think we're both uh, very excited and honored to be here. Uh, I think this is a topic that uh, both Ravi and I are very excited about and is an important one uh, for interventional radiology. It's an area that is sort of in its infancy. Uh, there aren't too many institutions that are doing these procedures. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the background, uh, some of the indications, and some of the basic aspects of the procedures. And then I think Robbie's going to talk about some more advanced stuff and a little bit of the uh, crazy stuff that he's come up with. Uh, so again, if you guys have any questions, just feel free to ask, uh, interrupt us, anything. Uh, so obviously there are a lot of people that we'd like to thank. Uh, Max Itkin is one of the main people. He uh, trained both Robbie and I at the University of Pennsylvania, and he's one of the founders of this lymphatic uh, world. And uh, that's similar with Greg Nadolsky, who's also at the University of Pennsylvania, and our colleague Joe Gimetti at the University of Michigan, who also does uh, lymphatic work as well. And then Jake and Anthony, who have helped us on many of our lymphatic projects. So tonight's uh, goal is we'll talk a little bit about the importance of the lymphatic system and the various structures, talk a little bit about how this forms the embryology. Uh, the lymphatic system is very variable and, and unpredictable and I think unknown. So we'll talk about some of the normal uh, structures and some of the variants that we see. We'll discuss how uh, the lymphatic system becomes injured and what we can do about it. Uh, we'll show some of the new imaging techniques. And then afterwards, uh, Ravi will go over a whole host of uh, different approaches to treating lymphatic disorders, such as the traditional anti-grade approaches, uh, retrograde access to the lymphatic system. We'll show a few cases of some stent graft techniques that we came up with. Uh, Ravi will show his Borale and Boral techniques that he developed. And we'll show a few other uh, fancy things, such as glue embolization and Denver shunts. So just a little bit about the basics of the lymphatic system. As you probably are all aware, uh, the lymphatic system is, conduct is basically comprised of a bunch of lymphatic channels that are linked together by lymph nodes. Uh, the thing that we think of most often is the thoracic duct, which is the main lymphatic conduit of the entire body. And this is where historically uh, most of our interventions have been uh, developed. So it's a structure that's in the mid-abdomen. It drains most of our lymphatic fluid uh, from the intestinal lymphatics or the abdominal lymphatics all the way up to the venous system in the neck. So it carries the vast majority of the lymphatic fluid throughout the body. That's usually one to two liters per day. And uh, that comprises essentially 75% of all of our lymphatic fluid. As I said, it uh, begins in the abdomen or the cisterna chile, which is this dilated structure uh, somewhere between L2 and L4. And it extends all the way to the left jugular venous angle, which is where the internal jugular vein meets the subclavian vein. And uh, that's the normal structure. 
So what typically happens is the lymphatics somehow become damaged, usually, usually iatrogenically from surgery or so forth. And as a result, they tend to leak chylus fluid and that's either chylus pleural effusions, uh, chylothorax, or chylus ascites, uh, fluid building up in the abdomen. It can also result in lymphedema or swelling of the uh, lymphatics as well. And why is this important? Well, this can be catastrophic in general because uh, with chylus effusions or chylus uh, ascites uh, comes the loss of a lot of fluid, proteins, electrolytes, and uh, lymphocytes and immune modulators. Uh, and as a result, it basically result, results in dysregulation of the body. And uh, this can lead to substantial mortality. So a little bit about embryology, which everyone uh, doesn't really like. I don't like it too much myself. Uh, so the lymphatic embryology is certainly, uh, a lot of it is unknown. A lot of these uh, changes in the development of the lymphatics start in the sixth week. Uh, so the lymphatics develop uh, concomitantly with the venous system. So as the venous system develops, the lymphatics develop as well. Uh, so the, lymph, the lymphatic system develops around the sixth week, then lymph nodes develop around the ninth week. And through a series of uh, formation and regression, it ultimately results in more or less two distinct uh, lymphatic components. One is the thoracic duct that I talked about, which drains the majority of the body. It drains the lower legs, the abdomen, and the whole left side of the body. And it dumps into the left jugular venous angle. And then there's a remnant, much smaller right-sided lymphatic system, which drains the right side of the body, and, or the right arm and the right head, the right side of the head, and that drains into the right jugular venous angle. So essentially, that's the normal structure. But any abnormalities in development can cause congenital uh, disruptions of the lymphatic system that can also lead to problems. So. The normal course, and when I say normal, uh, I'm a little bit hesitant to use that term because the unique thing about the lymphatics is that it's always uh, variable and there is no true normal. But when we think of uh, normal from looking at uh, anatomic studies, uh, we think of a lower extremity lymphatics that then give rise to this dilated uh, lymphatic channel called the cisterna chile which is somewhere between T12 and actually L3 or L4. Um, and once that kind of collects, it then gives rise to the thoracic duct. And the thoracic duct rises uh, from the cisterna chile along the anterior portion of the vertebral body. Uh, it's between the aorta and the azagous vein. And this will come, uh, this will be important later when Ravi describes uh, how to access it and how to treat it. So it then enters the thorax through the diaphragm or the aortic hiatus. And again, it runs along the uh, anterior aspect of the posterior mediastinum. And at about uh, T5 or T6, it crosses towards the left and then behind the heart and uh, the esophagus, and then it drains into the left jugular venous angle. And the important aspect here is that it's uh, close to or in continuity uh, with a variety of thoracic structures, for instance, the esophagus and the heart. Uh, so during uh, esophageal surgery, such as esophagectomy or cardiothoracic surgery, uh, the lymphatic system can often be injured. So here's an example of the supposed normal uh, thoracic duct, uh, which we can see in green. So typically, again, it arises, uh, there's a, a dilated uh, collection of lymphatics, the cisterna chile. Uh, this then rises up towards the head, anterior to the spinal column, and then it drains into the left jugular venous angle. So again, here you can see this uh, image from an ascent, ascending lymphangiogram. You can see the typical course of the thoracic duct uh, rising through the chest and then draining to, into the left jugular venous angle. So uh, there are a whole host of anatomic variants, uh, which makes treating lymphatic disorders particularly challenging, but also makes it exciting as well, uh, because you always find something a little bit different. Uh, so in general, we think of a left-sided thoracic duct uh, draining into the left, left jugular venous angle, but you can also have a right-sided thoracic duct uh, 
You can also have various duplications, such as a proximal duplication, a distal duplication. Uh, you can have a plexiform variant where there is no continuous thoracic duct. It's a whole bunch of discrete lymphatic channels or discrete lymph nodes. And you can also have uh, variants where you have absence of the cisterna chile altogether. Uh, so again, this is uh, an example of what we call a total left-sided thoracic duct, where basically everything is on the left side of the vertebral column. Uh, the cisterna chile starts all the way on the left, it rises all the way up leftward, and then jump, uh, dumps into the jugular venous angle. And again, just on these ascending lymphangiograms and digital subtraction lymphangiograms, you can see again the outline of the thoracic duct and then draining into the uh, left jugular venous angle. This is in contrast to a right-sided thoracic duct. Again, you have a uh, cisterna chile. However, here uh, the thoracic duct rises on the right side of the vertebral column and then dumps into the uh, right jugular venous angle. Uh, this one is a little bit rare, or I think I've only seen it once or twice. I think Robbie and I saw one uh, at Michigan within the last few months, but uh, some of these variants are, are rare and you may actually never see them very frequently. Here's an example of what we call our duplicated thoracic duct. Uh, so again, you can have a whole host of variants. Uh, here you have sort of a uh, multiple channels that a, the cisterna chile gives rise to multiple channels, either a proximal, which is here, where the duplication arises close to the cisterna chile, and then it converges into a single thoracic duct. And the importance of these is that if just one of these channels is treated in the case of a leakage, uh, leakage may still persist. So it's important to identify these variants and uh, when they're identified, if embolization is pursued, uh, to embolize them completely uh, so that no fluid uh, gets to the leakage. This is in contrast to a distal duplication. You can see here as the thoracic duct becomes closer to, as it uh, moves closer to the chest, you see uh, various pathways here that ultimately give rise to the leak up here, uh, this dark collection up here. Again, in some cases, uh, these can be particularly challenging because there is no true thoracic duct or lymphatic channel. We call these plexiform variants. So instead of a discrete duct that extends all the way from the abdomen to the chest, uh, we have a whole bunch of kind of disconnected uh, networks here. <clears throat> and this makes it very challenging because, again, if embolization is pursued, uh, the thoracic duct itself can't really be accessed. It's uh, just a bunch of small channels. Again, there are other techniques that uh, Ravi helped develop uh, that can treat things like this, and we'll discuss those a little bit later. But in, in general, uh, or originally, this was a uh, type of variant that was difficult to treat and uh, may not be able to be treated at all. Uh, this is an example of an absence absence of the cisterna chile. So most times, uh, after a lot of work, uh, the cisterna chile or that dilation can be visualized, and that's an area that can be accessed uh, for embolizing or treating lymphatic disorders, but sometimes you can't find anything, and there is no true dilation of the uh, lymphatic system, and we call that an absence of the cisterna chile. And this is, again, important because it leads to challenges when treating the thoracic duct because ultimately, uh, there's no great what, great site for access. So how are the lymphatics uh, typically injured? So there are a whole variety of ways that they can be injured. Typically, uh, we think of trauma to the lymphatic system. And in fact, esophagectomy is known as the number one cause of injury to the lymphatic system, uh, the thoracic duct in particular. Uh, that's essentially because the thoracic duct arises adjacent to the esophagus. So anytime an esophagectomy is performed for cancer or so forth, uh, it's very easy to injure the thoracic duct because it's only two or three millimeters and it rides just adjacent to the esophagus. But any other surgeries uh, that uh, for the treatment of head or neck malignancies but, or any kind of intracardiac or lung thoracic surgeries uh, have the potential to injure the thoracic duct. And actually uh, thoracic, uh, surgeons are the most frequent uh, refers to interventional radiology uh, for treating thoracic duct injuries because 
any sort of surgery that goes on, the in, on in the chest is very likely to uh, injure the thoracic duct. Uh, so we often think of trauma as the primary cause, but then there are a whole bunch of, and, and the mechanism here is obviously direct disruption uh, of the duct or the lymphatics itself. And as a result, uh, just spill lymphatic fluid either into the chest causing pleural effusions or into the abdomen causing cholecystitis. And in the abdomen, this can be a result of any kind of urologic surgery or any uh, general surgery to the abdomen that can disrupt the lymphatics as well. But on the other hand, you can have uh, various non-surgical causes for disruption of the lymphatics. Uh, and these tend to be things that either obstruct the lymphatics or cause them to become more permeable and leaky and uh, just spill fluid again. So occasionally we see these with patients with lymphoma or other more benign diseases such as sarcoidosis or tuberculosis. Uh, they can cause a sort of transient obstruction of the lymphatic system and uh, as a result uh, they can either leak or they can back up and ultimately uh, sort of explode, so to speak, and leak. Uh, there are also a whole, whole host of congenital or weird uh, malformations, such as lymphangiomatosis or Gorham's disease or a bunch of uh, unusual things that can lead to thoracic duct injury and leakage as well. So what do we normally do or what is the standard workup? So uh, I'll have to say a lot of this stuff is uh, people are not always familiar with this. And uh, like I said, some of the exciting aspects of all of this is that uh, these lymphatic procedures are a little bit unknown and not performed at many institutions. Uh, but when patients have a lymphatic leak, either chylus societies or chylus effusion, typically we begin by uh, initiating a low fat diet. Um, these can be either diets uh, with no fat uh, through TPN or diets that are mostly medium chain triglycerides in nature. And typically uh, patients are maintained on these for a while, several days to weeks. Uh, and the chylus effusion or chylus societies are monitored uh, to see if they decrease in volume. And uh, in some cases, uh, they resolve altogether. Uh, if they don't resolve, uh, various medications have been tried and are sometimes successful, uh, including somatostatin and octreotide. Um, and in some cases, uh, the injury and the effusion or the ascites resolves, uh, but it's certainly not in all cases. So once conservative measures have failed, which is quite frequent, uh, there are many other options. Uh, so thoracic duct embolization uh, or embolization of lymphatics in general is one of the main procedures. Uh, it was developed a few years ago and uh, Ravi and I have helped uh, make some modifications to this or different approaches. So this is a, uh, as Ravi will talk a little bit later, a minimally invasive and a great way to treat the lymphatics in general. But uh, as many institutions are not performing this, or it's sort of a new intervention uh, in the toolbox, uh, historically, uh, other things have been pursued, such as either surgical ligation or tying off the thoracic duct, uh, pleurodesis, such as uh, where the uh, pleura is actually scarred down so that uh, pleural effusions can't develop pleurectomies as which uh, the pleural rind is removed so that effusions can't develop and uh, a variety of shunts uh, to remove uh, either pleural fluid or chylocystitis. And again, these are successful in some cases, uh, but the thoracic duct is very tiny. Uh, it's tough to ligate, it's tough to uh, find. So uh, these measures are not always successful. So how do we typically work up these patients? Uh, so typically, uh, patients uh, have some sort of surgical intervention or have uh, some uh, either malignancy or infection, and they develop either shortness of breath, and they're found to have a chylus pleural effusion, or they develop abdominal pain, and they're found to have ascites, or they develop lymphedema. And in general, the first step is to look at that fluid and to identify that it's high in triglycerides. Uh, 
so that the triglyceride count of this is greater than 120 grams per deciliter. Uh, and that's pretty characteristic of a chylus uh, fluid in nature, whether it be an effusion uh, or ascites. Uh, now, a variety of imaging techniques have been developed uh, to help guide lymphatic interventions and to help identify injuries or disruptions to the uh, lymphatics in general. So something that was originally used uh, or is used at some centers is uh, magnetic resonance imaging or magnetic resonance ductography. So essentially these are highly T2 weighted images. So uh, they're very, very highly, as I said, T2 weighted. So what that shows is it's a fluid sensitive sequence. Uh, so anything that has fluid uh, can be seen. So uh, you can do some fancy uh, cover, color overlays uh, or look for specific structures. And this can identify the lymphatic system. But again, it's small. Uh, it's variable in patients, so this doesn't always work. So in B, you can see sort of a uh, portion of the thoracic duct here in white. Again, it's T2 bright. And in C, you can see an image of the cisterna chile. So this, again, can be helpful to know if the patient has a cisterna chile, uh, which could be target for lymphatic interventions, or if the patient uh, has a disruption of the lymphatic duct. So uh, part of the tech, a newer technique, again, that uh, Max Itkin helped develop, and uh, he taught Ravi and I some of this, is MR lymphangiography. So this is essentially injecting contrast material into the lymph nodes and then doing uh, dynamic, performing dynamic images, essentially uh, fancy MR images that are uh, dynamic, so you monitor the contrast, uh, the gadolinium movement over time. And essentially, this is a real-time interpretation of the disruption of the lymphatics. So if you follow these images, one, two, three here, you can see a, the disruption of the lymphatics, and you can see the uh, fluid or the contrast collecting in the abdominal space there. Uh, so that's real-time uh, evidence that there is a lymphatic disruption and that it is collecting. And this lets you believe that a lymphatic intervention potentially will be successful. So Ravi and I helped uh, develop some additional techniques that we've used uh, throughout the lymphatic system. And this will be a little bit more evident as Ravi shows some cases later. Uh, but this is a uh, patient here. Uh, where we use endolymphatic ultrasound, or essentially we use IVIS or intravascular ultrasound uh, to help identify a thoracic duct leak. So here in the first image, uh, we performed an ascending lymphangiogram, as you can see here, and we weren't uh, truly uh, convinced that there was a leak or we had some trouble identifying it. You can see what looks like some contrast uh, accumulating along the chest tube here, uh, but there wasn't a frank disruption and so forth. So what we did is, uh, sorry, uh, we placed the intravascular ultrasound probe uh, through the lymphatics uh, in a fancy way, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And we took some images of the thoracic duct itself. And here, uh, this shows you the order right here. And you can see kind of, you can hallucinate and make out a little bit of a disruption right here which uh, ultimately was a direct disruption of the thoracic duct. Uh, so this is sort of a new technique. Uh, it hadn't been described for before. It's a little bit cumbersome, but it's uh, sort of showing the innovative aspects of uh, interventional radiology and sort of pushing the envelope a little bit. This is similar to a, uh, another technique that Ravi developed. This is the endolymphatic optical, optical coherence tomography. Uh, so again, this is a fancier method to evaluate the lymphatic system. So the idea here is this is a very high resolution image uh, that's used for coronary arteries. Uh, it has a very uh, short distance of imaging, but it's very, very high resolution. So it's perfect for small structures like the thoracic duct. Uh, so again, uh, we'll talk a little bit about this later. Uh, but this is a case where the 
the lymphatic system or the thoracic duct was accessed in a retrograde fashion, essentially from the neck downwards. And this uh, endolymphatic ultrasound probe was passed uh, through the thoracic duct and ultimately helped uh, image the thoracic duct. So this again is a case where uh, we couldn't identify any injury to the thoracic duct, but the patient had a persistent leakage and we knew or we suspected that there was some sort of lymphatic injury, but we couldn't find it by conventional images. So here you can see, uh, sorry, this is the uh, OCT or opti optical coherence tomography image, and you can see a disruption of the actual uh, duct itself here, and we ultimately embolized this and treated the patient. So those are some of the new and uh, sort of innovative imaging techniques of the thoracic duct. Uh, so the last thing I'll talk about briefly here is a little bit more historic. Uh, so this is how we initially uh, historically access the lymphatics. So we don't do this too often anymore, but this is the way a lot of us were trained. Uh, this was around when Robbie and I were training and it's a little bit obsolete now. So in order to identify the lymphatics originally, uh, they're so small and uh, they're much smaller than arteries and veins. So how do you actually access them? So what we typically did is we injected a dye, either lymphozerin blue or methylene blue into the web spaces of the toes here, as you can see. And this helped identify the actual lymphatics in the toes. Then a uh, more or less a cut down was performed and the individual lymphatics were identified uh, and they glowed blue at that point. And then either a butterfly needle or an angiocath or another device was passed into the lymphatics and lipidol or other contrast material was actually injected uh, into the the lymphatics of the foot. And then it would rise up the leg, uh, as you can see here, uh, lipidol or contrast material was connected uh, to these butterfly needles that were in the uh, lymphatic, the pedal lymphatics. It would then rise up the leg until it got to the groin. Now, this was used for many, many, many years, uh, but the problem was it could take uh, several hours, three hours, four hours to rise from the foot to the groin, to the thoracic, to the abdomen, to the chest. But this is the only way that we had. And uh, this is what was used for a long time. So Max Itkin and Greg Nadolsky at Penn came up with a new technique, uh, which essentially bypassed the lower extremities and was what we do today. And this is called pelvic intranodal lymphangiography. Uh, so essentially this bypassed the legs uh, so what's done here, is this is what we do today, uh, the nodes under ultrasound guidance, we identified the nodes in the groin. It's a little bit hard to see here, but here's one of the lymph nodes in the groin outlined by my arrow here uh, and, and by these white arrows. And then we place a needle, a 25 gauge needle into those lymph nodes. So essentially it's right in the groin bypassing the legs. And then we inject uh, contrast material such as lipidol or gadolinium directly from there. And then we're able to opacify the pelvic lymphatics and we're able to opacify the abdominal lymphatics and the chest lymphatics and able to do that much more rapidly uh, than coming from the leg. Uh, so this is kind of uh, intranodal lymphangiography is where uh, treatment options and various interventions of the lymphatics sort of begins. And with that, I'll uh, hand it off to Robbie and he can talk a little bit about the interventions. Perfect. Thanks, Jeff, for that awesome overview. Is there a way to switch the slides over to me? I, I have the same slides, so I can, that way I can control them. Yeah, it should be good to go momentarily. I think it's switching over. Okay, perfect. Is that working? Can you guys see it? Looks good on this end, yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. Great. It says showing paused Microsoft PowerPoint up there. Is that it's still working for sure? <laughs> 
I can't see it, Robbie. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought, because it's giving me some error. I'll try one other thing. That looks a little better. Okay, is it working now? I think it should be working. Yeah, it's oh, working. Okay. All right, I have to thank and acknowledge Jeff for putting together and compiling these slides. Yeah, he did a great job doing that. Um, so one of the important things with doing any sort of lymphatic interventions is to first figure out where the leak is coming from. And, and as Jeff described, the imaging modalities that you can use to diagnose where the leak is, uh, you also need to use your clinical judgment, uh, laboratory testing, as well as imaging all cohesively to figure out exactly where the leak is coming from. Because where the leak is originating from is essential to figuring out how the best approach to treat uh, a chyle leak or uh, idiopathic chylocystitis or for whatever reason uh, a patient has either chylocystitis or chyloseffusion, um, how you approach treatment. So there's a few different approaches to accessing the lymphatic system. Uh, the most common that we use is uh, the anti-grade thoracic duct embolization. And uh, this is from a paper that uh, Jeff and uh, Dr. Hahn, uh, who was formerly at Brigham, now at uh, UCLA Harbor, um, uh, wrote together. Uh, this basically is a schematic demonstrating uh, the anti-grade uh, intranodal embolization technique. So the way we do this at Michigan is we access lymph nodes within the groins using ultrasound guidance with a 25 gauge spinal needle. We slowly inject uh, lipiodol uh, through a syringe or either using a syringe or using an insufflator. Um, we also typically place sequential compression devices on the uh, calves. This was um, uh, developed by uh, Dr. Nadalski and Itkin at the University of Pennsylvania. And we found that this greatly improves transit time of lymphatic contrast. And obviously this is significantly faster than doing pedal lymphangiography. So once we've successfully opacified the uh, pelvic lymphatics and the retroperitoneal lymphatics, we try to find a target within the abdomen, which we can subsequently access the thoracic duct. So uh, usually it's a little bit below the level of the cisterna chile, but our, see, the cisterna chile is a good backup option if you can't access the lymphatic channel below that level. Um, the reason for this is that so, so, so that you can potentially avoid gluing the cisterna chile on the way out. So after we've opacified the cisterna chile, we then access the, the uh, uh, lymphatic channel uh, using a 21 gauge chiba needle, which we put a slight curve on the end of the needle. And then through that, we at Michigan at least pass a transcend wire. Uh, you can alternatively use a V18 wire or any number of different 018 wires. Uh, we found that 018 wires provide the best support for being able to subsequently advance a microcatheter. Um, so once you access the uh, thoracic duct using uh, a wire, uh, which can sometimes be painstaking because you're trying to basically pin a lymphatic channel up against the spine and then slowly retracting your needle as you try to probe with the wire to get access into the thoracic duct. Uh, once you've successfully cannulated it using a wire, we can then pass a microcatheter into the uh, thoracic duct. We typically use a 2.4 French prograde microcatheter, and usually a 110 centimeter length is suitable. Uh, you don't need the longer lengths necessarily. Uh, and we use usually you have to make sure that you have a long enough transcend wire uh, when you use these microcatheter lengths because there's a 135 centimeter transcend wire. And if you get that in, you'll get really frustrated with the fact that you only have a 110 centimeter microcatheter and, and then you're trying to potentially get a catheter into the. Uh, can you guys hear me again? It's it cut out for a second. Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, okay. Um, so after that, okay, perfect. Okay, it, it lost connection for some reason. This seems to happen to me every time. Um, so once you've successfully accessed the thoracic duct with a microcatheter, that's when you can subsequently do the embolization. Um, so the way we embolize the thoracic duct is we typically put two or three coils at the terminus of the thoracic duct just prior to the jugulosubclavian junction, and then use uh, N-butyl cyanoacrylate glue to subsequently glue the duct with, by mixing it with lapiodol. So just like you'd glue anywhere else in the body, we typically use a two to one concentration of uh, 
of glue, uh, of lipidol to glue. Um, so two cc's of lipidol mixed with one cc of glue. You could also, in theory, use a one-to-one -one concentration as well, uh, but we find that that provides adequate impacification to successfully glue the thoracic duct and it's a thick enough and viscous material that, viscous enough that it, it won't um, travel th uh, through the coil nest. Um, so this is just fluoroscopic images in an adult showing how to uh, access the thoracic duct, uh, also from uh, Jeff's paper. So showing um, a 21 gauge needle being used to access the lymphatic channel. And then uh, uh, the final image is showing coils at the terminus of the thoracic duct and the uh, big white arrow showing glue within the thoracic duct. And you can see the leak where the, uh, uh, where the thoracic duct was injured. Uh, in this case, uh, su successfully glued and sealed um, with NBCA. So uh, here's a, a, the great thing about thoracic duct embolization is once you learn how to do it in adults, um, you can also apply these techniques to children as well. So we published a large series of patients where we did this uh, in pediatric as well as in neonatal patients or uh, infants um, and newborns. Uh, successfully and our technique is very similar to how you do it in adults. The main things to note uh, are in adults you can use uh, typically what we do for intranodal lymphangiography in adults is 8 to 10 cc's of uh, lipidol into the growing lymph nodes and subsequently chase it with saline in order to push it further into the retroperitoneal lymphatic system. Um, in children, we in neonates, particularly uh, anyone under a year of age, we typically only use about a cc of lipidol, and the transit time is actually quite fast in, in, in infants. So you can imagine due to their smaller uh, size, it uh, really transits up quite quickly. Um, typically in neonates, we try to do MR lymphangiography prior to doing any intervention because the lipidol itself can gum up their lymphatics to the extent that uh, it can actually cause an obstruction if the patient doesn't actually have a leak. So if you're not sure whether it's a chyle leak or not based on clinical judgment, uh, based on history, then typically we do MR lymphangiography in, in pediatric patients to confirm the diagnosis. And then if we see a leak, then we go forward with traditional intranodal lymphangiography. Um, so in this patient, uh, this was a patient who had a congenital diaphragmatic hernia repair, who subsequently had an injury to the thoracic duct that was a known injury given the history of surgery, uh, had high output chylothorax in the left chest. Um, this kiddo weighed about five pounds or so, so relatively small in size. Um, so we used a very similar technique. We injected about one cc of lipidol into the uh, inguinal lymph nodes. And uh, after the cisterna chile was opacified, we accessed some lymphatic channel in the upper abdomen using a 21 gauge, uh, seven centimeter micropuncture needle, and then passed a transcend wire up into the thoracic duct, as you can see on this left image. And then after that, we were able to successfully pass a 2.4 French probate micro catheter up into the thoracic duct. So one thing you'll note in kids, uh, and particularly neonates, it can be hard to actually fit a microcatheter into the thoracic duct. Uh, fortunately, in this kiddo, we were able to get one in. Um, in. In another patient that we treated that was also very small, about four or five pounds, um, we could not get the microcatheter up this far into the thoracic duct, so we actually had to glue from a lower portion within the thoracic duct where it was a little more dilated. So you have to kind of adapt a little bit or you can use smaller microcatheters or smaller wire systems, but certainly it's much easier to track things over an 018 system if you can, if you can successfully achieve 018 cannulation. So uh, in this patient, you can see we put coils and glue uh, within the thoracic duct and there was resolution of the chyle leak. So um, other approaches include retrograde techniques. Uh, so uh, as Jeff had shown earlier, the OCT technique to do optical coherence tomography and uh, to get any you know, ultra, uh, intravascular ultrasound or intralymphatic ultrasound or endolymphatic ultrasound into the thoracic duct, you have to have some sort of retrograde access because you can't pass the large caliber devices through the trans transabdominally since you're traversing bowel, liver, whatever structures you're traversing. You don't really want to pass the uh, large device through the uh, abdomen that way. So we typically get access retrograde. So there's two ways to get access retrograde. One is to actually stick the uh, lymphatic antegrade and pass a wire out into the jugulosoclavian junction and then snare it from the SVC or from the brachiocephalic vein from a left arm uh, basilic or brachial vein approach. Um, alternatively, you can directly access the thoracic duct by using a uh, catheter to select the terminus of the thoracic duct, uh, 
which can be quite challenging to actually get through the valve at the terminus of the thoracic duct. Uh, we have done it successfully a couple of times with a SOS catheter or a REM catheter to successfully cannulate the terminus uh, and then pass a microcatheter through the valve and down into the thoracic duct. But mostly uh, the technique that helps kind of is that you can actually use the catheter to kind of opacify the thoracic duct and then stick it percutaneously uh, and access it retrograde that way. Alternatively, you can also use ultrasound guided techniques, which the folks at WashU and, uh, and UT Houston kind of developed um, and actually directly stick the uh, terminus of the thoracic duct as well. So uh, once you've successfully accessed the thoracic duct retrograde, you can then pass, you know, larger caliber devices, stents, um, ultrasounds, OCT, anything you like uh, from a retrograde approach. So this is a case example showing a retrograde thoracic duct embolization. So the interesting thing here is this patient uh, presented with uh, arm swelling and face swelling because they had complete occlusion of their subclavian vein and the axillary vein. And you can see once uh, on this top left image that all these collateral veins and subsequent filling of the uh, SVC. Um, however, once we successfully recanalized into this pouch from both a femoral and a uh, uh, arm approach, you can see we filled this kind of sa dilated sac um, of where the brachiocephalic vein and subclavian vein are. And the interesting thing about it is that you see, uh, because it's occluded on both sides, it actually, when we do a digital subtraction um, venography of this area, you actually see retrograde filling of the thoracic duct, which uh, this was quite peculiar in the sense that you don't ever really see this when you do a venogram. So in, it, the interesting th phenomenon that happened in this patient is that because of this uh, venous occlusion, the patient developed a, a chyle leak. And so there was no other explanation and no history of trauma to the thoracic duct, no history of anything else other than the fact that they had this arm swelling related to this uh, venous occlusion. And what happened in this patient, as you can see on the bottom right image, is that there was injury of the uh, uh, thoracic duct or actually disruption of the thoracic duct from back pressure uh, due to this high grade obstruction of the uh, venous system. The thoracic duct was pressurized because you can imagine the thoracic duct is dumping in here and it had nowhere to go and essentially it, all the pressure was building up within the thoracic duct and it subsequently ruptured in the lower chest. And so this patient presented with chylothorax. We had a very similar patient where, who also had uh, venous occlusion uh, who presented with uh, chylosocytes because it, it, it leaked more into the abdomen. Um, so what we did in this patient was we successfully uh, percutaneously accessed the th uh, terminus of the thoracic duct using an, a 21 gauge needle, passed a nitrex wire down into the thoracic duct retrograde, glued and embolized the uh, thoracic duct at the level of the leak on that bottom right image, and then we subsequently angioplastied and stented the uh, subclavian vein. Um, this was a case that Jeff and I did together. Um, that ended up being a really good out outcome in the sense of the patient's chylothorax and arm, arm swelling resolved. Um, so the other techniques that Jeff and I developed together were these um, uh, uh, techniques for doing stent grafting of the thoracic duct. Uh, and so the idea behind us even coming up with this was to see if there was a way to potentially preserve lymphatic flow uh, while also treating a patient who has a iatrogenic uh, leak. Uh, where you can actually define an area where there's a leak, or in patients who have plexiform leaks where you see disruptions or weepiness of the thoracic duct throughout the thoracic duct. And the goal would be to place a covered stent graft within the thoracic duct in order to seal the area that was leaking and, in theory, allow uh, anti-grade flow into the lymphatic system uh, the normal way and down into the subclavian vein. So we did kind of a series of these patients. We did several of these cases now where we've successfully stented the thoracic duct. In all patients, the thoracic duct leak uh, actually resolved. Uh, and so it was successful in that sense. We are not sure about the long-term patency of these stents given the slow flow within the lymphatic system. But um, regardless, the, if it, it basically is acting as a rather expensive embolic device. But in this, uh, in theory, it, uh, it would hopefully allow flow to be maintained. Um, so the way we perform thoracic duct stenting is similar to how we get access into the thoracic duct retrograde. So in these cases, we had gotten antegrade access into the thoracic duct, passed a wire out into the uh, superior vena cava or brachiocephalic vein and snared for getting through and through access. 
and then passed our stent delivery systems from a retrograde approach, as you can see in this schematic. So I'll show a few case examples or, uh, that Jeff put together. Um, this was a patient who had a, a large left chylothorax that was idiopathic. We didn't have any reason um, for why she had this, uh, but she'd had it for actually a fairly long period of time and had actually just get, been getting chronic uh, thoracentesis in order to drain the fluid. Um, so in this patient, we got access into the thoracic duct uh, by doing that anterograde retrograde snare technique and then passed a six French sheath down into the terminus of the thoracic duct. And you can see this area when we did a contrast injection where there was just weepiness of the central uh, uh, lymphatic system in the thoracic duct where there were these plexiform channels kind of leading into the chest. And so what we then did was place a six uh, millimeter by 15 centimeter Viabond stent graft across this segment uh, and you can see on the rightmost image a CT reconstructed image in the sagittal plane showing the stent graft. And you can see at least on this digital subtraction injection of the uh, thoracic duct on the third image here that there is patency of the stent. Um, again, we don't know the long-term patency of these stents. So this was a subsequent patient who had a, a heart transplant and had injury to the thoracic duct. Uh, you can see this pa patient had a relatively large caliber thoracic duct and uh, in this patient, we also got retrograde, anterograde, retrograde access using a snare. And you can see the tip of the sheath in the second image marked by the arrow. And then subsequent placed, uh, subsequently placed a seven millimeter, I believe, by a 15 centimeter uh, Viabon stent graft uh, and uh, thereby sealing the leak and the patient's leak completely resolved. Um, so this is a patient who will be coming up in extreme IR, uh, coming up soon, that Jeff and I did, uh, that uh, had actually presented with a mediastinal lymphangioma, which ruptured into the pericardial sac. Uh, he actually presented this case also at extreme IR this year at SIR. Uh, this uh, patient uh, presented with chylopericardium, essentially. They, we did a pericardiocentesis, placed a pericardial drain into the, uh, uh, into the space, and then drained, uh, drained off about 300 or 400 cc's of, um, of chyle, chylus fluid from the pericardial sac. And this patient actually uh, had a cardiac arrest on the table um, and after, uh, after going into cardiac tamponade and after placing the pericardial drain, we were able to successfully resuscitate her. And then we proceeded with uh, standard intranodal lymphangiography, uh, identified the uh, thoracic duct and cannulated it to antegrade initially, did this contrast injection showing these kind of uh, peculiar looking lymphatics that were kind of draining towards the mediastinal lymphangioma and the uh, anterior mediastinal lymphangioma and the uh, pericardial space. Uh, and so given this finding, we decided that we wanted to try to preserve lymphatic flow. So we got uh, arm access snared uh, for through and through access and then subsequently placed a stent graft, a short stent graft across this segment, uh, six millimeter by either five or 10 centimeter stent graft across this segment, sealing the area where it was leaking. And there was complete resolution of the pericardial effusion, as you can see on this coronal reconstructed CT image on the right um, with a, a, a pigtail marked by the arrowhead, which was removed uh, about one or two days later. Uh, and the patient went home with no significant side effects and the actual follow-up CT showed that there was actually shrinkage of that mediastinal lymphangioma. Um, so kind of an interesting case. Um, this was a patient, we, so we, we have patients who present with chylothoraces quite frequently, uh, an entity that comes up from time to time that's very difficult to treat uh, historically has been chylosocietes. Uh, so patients with chylosocietes are often, you know, in dire straits and uh, they're getting recurrent chronic paracentesis and uh, really have limited options in terms of surgical management. Um, you can try medical management with diet uh, restriction uh, and things of that nature, but uh, oftentimes these can be really devastating conditions to have because the patients get malnourished from having chronic paris and TCs, uh, and uh, they can be very difficult to treat. So this was a patient who had um, uh, a actual lymphoenteric fistula, uh, and you can see in these images uh, uh, where we performed this uh, boral technique, which is basically so boral and boral. So uh, balloon occluded retrograde abdominal lymphangiography is the diagnostic portion, and adding in the E in the end is the embolization as well. So we we published a series of three of these cases. Uh, previously that uh, all of which had really good outcomes with complete resolution of uh, chylosocietes. 
So the, these patients need to be selected appropriately. So again, we talked about having stratifying your leaks into either chest leak, where you do a thoracic duct embolization or thoracic duct stenting, um, or a uh, lower abdominal leak or a pelvic leak, which you can do intranodal lymphangiography or intranodal glue embolization, which we'll show some cases subsequently and uh, some subsequent slides, or upper abdominal uh, uh, lymphatic injury, specifically a retroperitoneal lymphatic injury due to a surgical intervention. And those patients are the ones that can benefit from this boral or boral uh, or borali technique. Um, so if you have uh, injury to the intestinal lymphatics, those can also occasionally be treated using these techniques, but you can also consider doing transhepatic lymphangiography, which um, uh, we can show some cases of that in the future, but uh, transhepatic lymphangiography is another approach for being able to get into the uh, lymphatic system as well, where you essentially stick a needle into the liver, just like doing a, a PTC or a percutaneous transhepatic cholangiogram, uh, except you pacify the lymphatics and then can either cannulate them, which can be next to impossible, or just directly embolize them through your needle uh, by using glue or onyx. Um, so, uh, so in this case, uh, so this patient presented with chylocystitis uh, and lymphoenteric fistula. So after getting anterograde retrograde access, you can see in the second uh, image, snaring for through and through access, uh, we then pass a balloon catheter down into the uh, thoracic duct retrograde. And so the idea behind this is very similar to how you do a VRTO where you occlude uh, flow uh, in the antegrade direction so that you can promote flow in the retrograde direction. So in this case, since thoracic duct flow is antegrade, we are placing a balloon, as you can see on the rightmost slide, into the thoracic duct above the level where the leak is, and then doing an injection through the balloon catheter in order to fill the uh, cisterna chile in this case, and demonstrate this lymphoenteric fistula in this patient. Um, this was another patient who had uh, Merkel cell carcinoma, who also underwent boral um, successfully at this point. This was one of our first cases that we did. We used a Sterling balloon in this case. We subsequently adapted to use Python balloons. You could also use a Scepter balloon with, with smaller lymphatics. Uh, uh, but uh, the, you, the idea behind it is that you use a balloon in order to occlude the thoracic duct. You certainly don't want to overinflate because you can rupture it uh, and cause, uh, you know, uh, potentially make things worse. So you, you obviously want to be gentle when you're inflating the balloon and doing contrast injection in order to pacify the lymphatics. So what we actually did in these cases was we used sotradecol uh, sclerosin to perform thoracic duct, or not thoracic duct, but, but retrograde lymphatic embolization in these patients. So here you can see when we initially did not have the balloon inflated, uh, this second um, panel here, second image, uh, you do not see any uh, lymphatic filling of the area where the leak is. However, after inflating a balloon and this third image, you can see that there's this lymphatic channel that leads to this area that eventually is the area where it's leaking. And so what we did was we got a catheter as close as we could to that area, uh, inflated the balloon, and performed embolization of this lymphatic channel using a mixture of sotradecol, lipidol, and air foam. Uh, so it created a foam, uh, similar to how you would create a foam to, to embolize a venous malformation or a vascular malformation. Um, and that worked. Uh, so this was actually remarkably successful. This patient had been having paracentesis pretty much one to two times a week, having eight to nine liters drained for about nine months uh, after having injury of uh, one of their retroperitoneal lymphatics after uh, uh, that Merkel cell uh, surgery. Um, and after doing this procedure, there was complete resolution. And you can see on a follow-up CT performed a couple of months later, the sclerosin to actually entering that same lymphatic channel and sclerosing that area. And notably, you see no chylocytes on this image uh, or no ascites on this image. So uh, that was remarkably successful. We had a couple of other cases that went really well as well. Um, so this is some, this is a, the, pretty much that I think that same case that, that was on the first slide, but also showing this component of the the uh, abdominal lymphangioma that this patient had, uh, and then you can see uh, a lymphoenteric fistula here as well, uh, where we uh, performed sclerotherapy of the. Um, uh, abdominal lymphatics and the lymphatic channel that was leading to this lymphoenteric fistula. And you can see a drain within the uh, lymphangioma and, and uh, 
uh, chylocystitis that the patient had as well. Um, so the interesting thing in this patient as well is that the patient's albumin was very low prior to doing this procedure. And actually the patient had endoscopy showing chyle leaking into the duodenum. And uh, after performing, uh, this was a case that Jeff did that uh, after performing uh, boral uh, or this retrograde lymphatic embolization, uh, there was complete uh, resolution of the lymphoenteric fistula. And there was also uh, significant improvement in the patient's albumin, uh, which went from the twos up to normal, like three and a half Three, three, three and a half range. Um, this case is also, I think, going to be coming up in uh, in JVIR as a extreme IR case as well. So, so, uh, so now switching gears a little bit from upper abdominal leaks down to lower abdominal or pelvic leaks. So intranodal embolization techniques can be extraordinarily helpful for patients who have low uh, leaks. So you don't really want to do boral in patients who have a pelvic leak or a groin leak. Uh, the best approach to do this is to actually perform intranodal glue embolization. So uh, Jeff and I have you know, published a few papers on this. We have a larger series coming up soon. Uh, in JBS, uh, showing, uh, demonstrating this technique for performing intranodal uh, glue embolization. So the so way we do this is, so this patient had a lymphocele in the groin uh, after having a vascular surgery a, a bypass graft placed, and you can see that on this bottom right image where you see the vascular graft, um, and had a very high output uh, chyle leak uh, from this JP drain that was in the right groin. It was roughly 1,700 cc's a day of, of chyle leak. Uh, and after performing intranodal lymphangiography uh, with lapidol, we were able to identify a lymphatic or a lymph node that seemed to be leading to the area that was leaking. So oftentimes you end up having to stick several different lymph nodes and perform intranodal lymphangiography through them to identify finally the one that's actually contributing to the leak. There can be multiple lymph nodes contributing to the leak. And after you identify that, you then inject glue directly into the lymph node. And typically, contrary to uh, glue embolization of the thoracic duct, where you actually have a catheter physically within the structure that you want to embolize, i.e. the thoracic duct, um, in these cases, you're injecting glue directly from a lymph node, so you want to use a more dilute mixture of glue. So we typically dilute the glues uh, to five to one, uh, five of lapidol to one of NBCA, or even up to eight to one uh, of that same uh, same concentration of uh, glue. So eight of lapidol to one of glue. Um, so uh, and you can kind of gauge that based on how far away the leak is from your lymph node in order to ensure that the glue makes it up there. And the other important thing with glue embolization in general, as with anywhere in the body, is that you prime uh, your either structure with dextrose prior to. So D5 needs to be injected first, uh, whether you're embolizing the thoracic duct or embolizing through a lymph node. We typically will fill the lymph node with some dextrose in order to end lymphatics with some dextrose so that the uh, glue actually travels. Otherwise, it'll just get stuck in the lymph node and won't go anywhere. So you got to make sure you inject enough dextrose to fill uh, the tributaries that lead to the lymphatics that you want to glue. And then you displace them then with the lapidol glue mixture. So after embolization of this patient, there was complete resolution of, uh, of the groin lymph lymphocele and the groin and the drain was subsequently removed. So another patient where we performed uh, intranodal embolization of uh, a, a, a groin leak, a groin lymphocele, where uh, you inject these lymph nodes directly with lapidol. Um, you can also use contrast. Uh, and then once you identify the one that's leaking, then you can use glue. Um, so there's a few different ways to do this. So this was a patient that, uh, I believe this was one of Jeff's cases that uh, we that he did uh, initially, they had um, uh, kind of a pelvic ascites that seemed to be emanating from the pelvis uh, because they had recently had some sort of robotic surgery in the pelvis. And um, they initially performed, uh, this was done by NukeMed initially, the lymphocentigraphy with SPECT uh, imaging. And uh, you can see that there is leakage of the radio tracer into the peritoneum. And uh, this confirmed a chyle leak within the pelvis. So Essentially, at that point, intranodal lymphangiography was performed, and glue embolization was then performed directly through uh, lymph nodes um, uh, and successfully sealing this area of leak. So actually, there was contrast injected, it looks like, on these images initially, and then after that, uh, glue was injected 
um, this was actually the case that Jeff did where uh, there was uh, a patient who had a pelvic uh, leak. And you can see this is actually a very great example of uh, an, a pelvic uh, leak where you can see this extravasation of lipidol into the peritoneum and into the pelvis um, after doing intranodal angiography, and then glue embolization was then performed with resolution of this patient's pelvic, uh, pelvic leak. Um, so this was a patient, so this switching gears again a little bit. Uh, so when you have limited options, uh, so Kyla Societies in general has limited options. So when techniques either don't work or you have patients who don't want to undergo some of these techniques, you could consider doing another procedure, which can be your kind of bailout procedure in the setting of, uh, in the setting of Kyla Societies. Um, so a patient, this particular patient was a 68-year-old with chylosocytes due to pancreatitis induced SMV occlusion and preportal hypertension. He had a history of necrotizing gallstone pancreatitis. Uh, his workup was completely negative for CHF and cirrhosis, and he was uh, maximized on medical management using octreotide, which is typically our first approach for medical management of chylos uh, leak. Um, and his albumin was low, his protein level was low, or on the lower end of normal. Uh, and so he uh, had, was offered a few different options, but actually just wanted something that he could get out of the hospital right away without any follow-up. And so another thing to always consider uh, in the setting of Kyle leak or recurrent ascites uh, that's not, be, not able to be treated um, is uh, Denver shunt. So um, the other things to rule out prior to this are portal hypertension related ascites. So you gotta make sure there's not a portal vein occlusion that you can potentially fix with portal vein reconstruction or portal uh, vein decompression um, with TIPS, for example. Uh, but in this particular patient, there was none of those things. Uh, he had a large volume chyla societies requiring eight liter paracentesis weekly uh, and his fluid triglycerides were 436 and the fluid was very milky in consistency. So what a Denver shunt is, is a peritoneal venous shunt. So essentially what you're doing is, re is connecting, the chyla connecting the peritoneal ascites to the venous system. So Typically, Kyle eventually gets into the venous system through the lymphatic tributaries. So uh, going through the thoracic duct down to the subclavian, uh, jugular subclavian junction and down into the venous system. So what you're doing is now creating a artificial pathway for this Kyle that's leaking from the lymphatics uh, to get back into the venous circulation. So the way you do that, uh, so this, so again, just to back up a little bit, this patient had uh, technetium 99 sulfur chloride lymphocentigraphy done, and you can see on uh, delayed images, there's filling of uh, groin lymphatics and eventually getting up into the mid-abdomen, but even at 24 hours, there was never any filling, so we really actually didn't uh, you know, spread this out too much because we actually did uh, 180 minutes, so three hours, six hours, and then uh, at 600 minutes, and then at 24 hours as well. Uh, and there was never really any filling of the thoracic duct uh, or identification of any sort of leak. So we were concerned if we did standard intranodal lymphangiography that we might make this patient worse. Um, just like when you do, if you were to do a thoracic duct embolization in a patient with chylosocytes, uh, that they would likely get, they would get worse because you're preventing um, drainage uh, through the normal pathway and it would back up into the abdomen and cause robust uh, chylosocytes. So this particular patient wanted to have something uh, such as a Denver shunt and so this uh, shunt is made by BD Medical, uh, Beckman Dickinson, so uh, that the shunt that we use is double valved. Um, there's a few different versions. There's one that has 15, a 15.5 French and a 15.5 French peritoneal as well as uh, venous end, and there's a smaller version that has a smaller profile venous end. Um, the peritoneal end has multiple side holes in order to promote drainage. Um, the way you perform this, this gets completely embedded under the skin. This is a pump chamber that you you can use to, that the patient uses to pump the shunt uh, about 15, 10 to 15 times in the morning, 10 to 15 times in the evening, and it essentially allows active and passive flow uh, and prevents retrograde flow of blood into the peritoneum and only allows antegrade flow from the peritoneum into the venous system. So this can be a, a good bailout technique so, uh, for patients who have uh, chronic chyla societies that have either failed other approaches or do not want to go undergo other 
treatments. So here you can see it's uh, relatively radiolucent, but you can see the venous portion of this catheter extending into the uh, subclavian, or through the subclavian or brachycephalic vein uh, coming from a jugular vein approach and eventually terminating in the right atrium. Uh, and uh, the uh, peritoneal end you can see terminating within the abdomen here. So the issues with these shunts is that when you're draining thick chylocytes, they can get occluded. So we found that by leaving them a little bit deeper, almost like how you leave a dialysis catheter lower in the right atrium, we've had less issues with fibrin sheets developing, um, but they can develop fibrin sheets on the venous end if you leave them short, just given the fact that you're draining thick chylocytes into the um, into the venous circulation. Um, the other thing that can happen is they can get clogged on the peritoneal end. Um, the nice thing about these is that you can percutaneously stick them with non-coring needles and troubleshoot them by injecting contrast first. And if, if you see an issue, you can put a wire through it. Uh, sometimes you have to explant it partially and, and declog it, but uh, a lot of the time you can inject some TPA or do something else to kind of declog it. Um, but uh, this can be a really, a good solution in certain patients that are appropriately selected. Um, so this patient had complete resolution of their abdominal distension after this procedure and didn't require any uh, uh, subsequent paracentesis. So in conclusion, uh, we talked about, uh, Jeff spoke about the importance of the thoracic duct, the embryology, the anatomic courses, uh, the var various variants, uh, and then the types of injuries that can happen to the lymphatic system, whether they be uh, iatrogenic or idiopathic, um, we talked about the treatment approaches, uh, including anti-grade, retrograde approaches, ultrasound-guided access to the th uh, terminus of the thoracic duct, um, and using a, and also access by a transvenous and uh, uh, anti-grade, retrograde scenario techniques. Uh, Jeff talked about the lymphatic advanced lymphatic imaging techniques, such as MR lymphangiography, using optical coherence tomography, and um, uh, intravascular ultrasound to help with sizing or to help with diagnosing leaks in patients who have um, who don't have uh, an identifiable leak and that's an important thing to mention because you can have patients who have what looks like a normal thoracic duct but for for all that it's worth you you know the patient has a chyle leak somewhere because they, they have a chylus effusion um, and you've excluded other things uh, and oftentimes doing either some sort of pressurized injection where you're coming from a retrograde approach and doing a contrast injection can demonstrate the leak, but some of these advanced imaging modalities can actually help you as well in those cases where you where you have a chyle leak, because you certainly don't want to embolize a normal thoracic duct uh, because it will make the patient worse. But if you know the patient has a chyle leak, uh, you should do everything you can to make sure you exclude any sort of chyle leak. Uh, by using these advanced technique, advanced imaging techniques. So uh, it, Jeff spoke briefly about pedal lymphangiography as a historic kind of thing. Um, a few institutions are still using it, but uh, it seems to, we've seemed to have switched towards the intranodal lymphangiography techniques now. We talked about anti-grade and retrograde embolization techniques, the thoracic extent reconstruction, boral and borali for uh, retroperitoneal upper abdominal chyle leaks, uh, intranodal cyanuric leak, glue embolization for pelvic leaks or pelvic lymphocytes, and then uh, your bailout procedure, which is the uh, Denver shunt. So hopefully this was a good overview kind of summarizing all the different techniques. Um, and uh, here's a few of our references uh, from papers that we've written. So Jeff and I would be happy to answer any questions at this point. Uh, and this is our, these are both our email addresses. If any questions come up later down the road, um, we'd be happy to answer anything right now or in the future. Awesome, thank you guys. That was just such a great, great example of a real innovation you guys have going on in this field over there. And I think particularly for me, a, a great example of kind of approaching a lot of these problems um, with, I guess, what is more standard techniques. I mean, especially with the Borel and things, the balloon occlusion, um, it's a great new application. You know, at the training level, it's a really good example to see how, you know, you treat. We're being trained to do image guided procedures and not necessarily just treat one uh, instance of or one example of disease at a time, um, which is something I always try and keep in mind. And I think just a great example, again, um, I do have a couple questions here for you. Uh, um, one, when working in the lymphatic system, are there any unique perils or pitfalls or anything to keep in mind that's di different from manipulating arteries or veins? Well, I think as a, one thing, certainly, as Robin talked about, a lot of people just tend to fail with these procedures because they 
I don't know the adequate equipment. So when I had started, I had used a whole host of different uh, 018 wires, a whole host of uh, different catheters. But as Ravi sort of described, there is a very good toolbox that makes this very, very successful. As he said, uh, the biggest difficulty is accessing the cisterna chile or the thoracic duct. Uh, but if you use the same equipment and you use it every time, it's actually relatively easy. So a 21 gauge needle with a little bit of a bend on the end uh, so that you can guide it towards the thoracic duct and then using a transcend wire with a 2.4 French prograde catheter uh, really increases the likelihood that you'll be successful. Other wires such as Nitrix, B18 and so forth uh, tend to either be too floppy or too stiff, uh, but really the, co the combination of the transcend and the prograde microcatheter uh, really sets you up for success. Great, thank you. Uh, one more here. Uh, at the trainee level, for your residents or fellows, are there any important points or what are the most important points in seeing these patients not intraprocedurally but on the floor, either pre or post-op? And what do you think uh, are the highlights to make sure are included in your discussion with them when you're bringing these procedures up as possibilities? So some of the important things to remember uh, with uh, Kyla's leak or Kyla's uh, Kyla thorax or Kyla society's workup is knowing the numbers that you use for your cutoffs for the triglyceride levels, which is typically somewhere between 110 and 120 is what we use for um, for triglyceride level. And once it's elevated above that, uh, that's when you get concerned about it being a Kyla leak. Uh, in some patients, we have to do like a cream test or do a, a ice cream challenge type of thing and feed them a fatty diet in order to prove whether it is a chyle leak or not. So that's something you can do. Uh, typically, these patients are on tube feeds or um, or get or NPO in order to ensure that the chyle leak is resolved, and we keep them that way after the embolization as well for at least a week or so. And uh, some of them will be on these no-fat diets uh, like Vivanex tube feeds or uh, whatnot um, uh, for some period of time before transitioning to a low-fat diet and eventually getting back on uh, normal diet. Um, so it's important to basically reiterate to the team not to put them on a fatty diet right away after you've done an embolization procedure. Um, you know, we slowly transition them back to a normal diet. Um, so that's that's one clinical thing to be aware of. Um, the other things are that glue can potentially migrate into other structures such as the venous system. So it's important to make sure that doesn't happen intraprocedurally, but it can in theory happen post-procedurally as well. So you know if the patient presents with a PE or symptoms of a PE, that would be something to, to look out for as well. Um, that is rare that that happens, but it can happen. Um, so uh, those are most of the things to remember. Um, patients uh, after having pelvic lymph lymphatic embolization performed can develop or uh, are a little more prone to potentially developing lymphedema or scrotal edema. It's usually self-limiting as lymphovenous collaterals develop. Uh, it typically does not happen in patients who have thoracic duct embolization. So after you close down the thoracic duct, you really shouldn't see uh, lymphedema or uh, anything of that nature. But when you em uh, embolize the downstream lymphatics in the pelvis or in the groin, uh, they can present with uh, uh, swelling of that limb or uh, have edema. It, it doesn't always happen because uh, most patients do have, you know, robust lymphatics that uh, are extra pathways for them to drain. But if it does happen, uh, we uh, typically manage medically uh, and then uh, consider, you know, giving them time for them to resolve. Uh, and physical therapy certainly, and physical and occupational therapy certainly help. And and I think one other thing to keep in mind is, as Robbie said, so uh, Max and Scott Tertola are the ones who uh, showed that there's a about a 15% uh, risk of lower extremity edema after these procedures or lymphedema. Uh, but in general, uh, things are relatively safe. Despite going through the abdomen and going through multiple structures, the risk of venous injury, arterial injury, or other lymphatic injury is relatively low. And Ravi and I have a series uh, coming up in JVS uh, which shows only uh, two complications, one lymphatic complication, one uh, venous uh, 
complication after all of our uh, lymphatic procedures at uh, the University of Michigan. So uh, there are potential complications, but they're relatively uh, minimal, and the success rate of the, these procedures can be very great. All excellent points. Thank you guys so much. Uh, that's all I have for you at this time, unless you guys have any final uh, words of wisdom for us. But to our audience, thank you for sticking out with us. Um, thank you for listening. And, and Dr. Srinivasa, Dr. Chick, thank you again so much. Um, these webinars are really kind of uh, unreplaceable for the RFS, and I think they get a lot of great teaching points out there and, and really bring people into the, the fold of our group and coming back for more and more webinars and learning as they go. Um, so again, thank you. If you have any final words, uh, I'll leave it to you and we'll wrap it there. Uh, I think I'll just say, like, I, I tried to uh, stress that uh, this is a very exciting field uh, for interventional radiology. And I think the exciting aspect is that many people are familiar with the standard techniques, uh, the anti-grade approach, as Robbie talked about. But uh, there are so many opportunities for, there's so many unknowns and so many opportunities for uh, new techniques. It was that uh, up until a year ago, that Baral and that Barale technique uh, didn't exist. Uh, and Ravi developed it just trying to come up with a way to treat Kyla societies. And uh, there's so much that we don't know. And uh, there's a lot that we all can do to treat these difficult uh, to manage problems. Awesome. Thank Sounds you guys good. again so much. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks again. All right, everyone. Like I mentioned before, uh, these will be recorded and placed up on YouTube if you want to go back and look for anything. Uh, search for the IR Education channel uh, from the RFS, and, and you'll find all the ones uploaded there uh, throughout the last several years, so you can go back and take a look. And once again, thank you all for coming.